Dante's Inferno, Canto 33, Count Ugolino and the Archbishop Ruggieri, the death of Count Ugolino's sons, third division of the Ninth Circle, Potolome, traitors to their friends, Frere Abarigo, Branco d'Oria. His mouth uplifted from his grim repast, that sinner wiping it upon the hair of the same head that he behind with had wasted. Then he began, Thou wilt I renew the desperate grief which wrings my heart already to think of only ere I speak of it. But if my words be seed that may bear fruit of infamy to the traitor whom I gnaw, speaking and weeping shalt thou see together. I know not who thou art, nor by what mode thou hast come down here. But a Florentine thou seemest to me truly, when I hear thee. Thou hast to know I was Count Ugolino, and this one was Ruggeri, the archbishop. Now I will tell thee why I am such a neighbor, that by effect of his malicious thoughts trusting in him I was made prisoner, and after put to death I did not say. But nevertheless, what thou canst not have heard, that is to say, how cruel was my death, here shalt thou, and shalt know if he has wronged me. A narrow perforation in the mew which bears because of me the title of famine, in which others still must be locked up, had shown me through its opening many moons already, when I dreamed of the evil dream which of the future rent for me the veil. This one appeared to me as lord and master, hunting the wolf and whelps upon the mountain for which the Pisans cannot look us see, with the sleuth hounds gaunt and eager and well trained. Gualandi, with Sesmondi and Lanfianchi, had sent out before him to the front. After a brief course seemed unto me forspent the father and the sons, and with sharp tushes it seemed to me I saw their flanks ripped open. When I before the morrow was awake, moaning amid their sleep, I heard my sons who with me were, and asking after bread. Cruel indeed art thou, if thou yet not grieve, thinking of what my heart foreboded me, and weepest thou not, what art thou wont to weep at? They were awake now, and the hour drew nigh at which our food used to be brought to us, and through this his dream was each one apprehensive, and I heard locking up the under door of the horrible tower, whereat without a word I gazed into the faces of my sons. I wept not. I within so turned to stone, they wept, and darling little Anselm mine said, Thou dost gaze so, father, what doth ail thee? Still not a tear I shed, nor answer made all of that day, nor yet the night thereafter, until another sun rose on the world. As now a little glimmer made its way into the Dolores prison, and I saw upon four faces my very own aspect, both of my hands in agony I bit, and, thinking that I did it from desire of eating, on a sudden they uprose and said they, Father, much less pain will give us if thou do eat of us. Thyself didst get to clothe us with this poor flesh, and do thou strip it off. I calmed me then, not to make them more sad. That day we all were silent, and the next... Ah, obdurate earth, wherefore didst thou not open? When we had come unto the fourth day, God threw himself down at stretched before my feet, saying, My father, why dost thou not help me? And there he died. And, as thou seest me, I saw the three fall, one by one, between the fifth day and the sixth, whence I betook me, already blind, to groping over each, and three days called them after they were dead, then hunger did what sorrow could not do. When he had said this, with his eyes distorted, the wretched skull resumed he with his teeth, which, as a dog's upon the bone, were strong. Ah, Pisa, the opprobrium of the people of the fair land where the sea doth sound, 
sent slow to punish thee thy neighbors are and let the capraia and gorgona move and make a hedge across the mouth of arno that every person in thee it may drown for if count ugolino had the fame of having in thy castles thee betrayed thou shouldst not on such cross have put his sons guiltless of any crime thou modern thebes there are youth Merugoscione and brigata and the other two my song doth name above we passed still further onward where the ice and other people ruggedly in swathes not downward turned but all of them reversed weeping itself there does not let them weep in grief that finds a barrier in the eyes turns itself inward to increase the anguish because the earliest tears a cluster form and in the manner of a crystal visor fill all the cup beneath the eyebrow full and notwithstanding that as in a callous because of cold all sensibility at station had abandoned in my face still it appeared to me i felt some wind whence i my master who sets this in motion is not below here every vapour quenched whence he to me full soon shalt thou be where thine eyes shall answer make to thee of this seeing the cause which raineth down the blast and one of the wretches of the frozen crust cried out to us o soul so merciless that the last post is given unto you lift from mine eye the uh, eyes the rigid bells that i may rent the sorrow which impregs my heart a little ere the weeping we congeal went side to him if thou wouldst have me help thee say who thou wast and if i free thee thee not may i go to the bottom of the ice then he replied i am friar habarigo he am i of the fruit of the bad garden who here a date am getting for my fig oh said i to him now art thou too dead and he to me how may my body fare up in the world no knowledge i possess such an advantage has this Ptolemaea, that oftentimes the soul descendeth here sooner than atropos in motion sets it and that thou mayest more willingly remove from off my countenance these glassy tears know that as soon as any soul betrays as i have done his body by a demon is taken from him who thereafter rules it until his time has wholly been revolved itself down rushes into such a cistern and still perchance appears the body of yonder shade that winters here behind me this thou shouldst know if thou hast just come down it is ser branca doria and many years have passed away since he was thus locked up i think said i to him thou dost deceive me for branca doria is not dead as yet and eats and drinks and sleeps and puts on clothes in mode above said he of melbranch there were as boiling the tenacious pitch as yet had uh, michel zonk not arrived when this one left a devil in his stead and his own body and one near of kin who made together with him the betrayal but hitherward stretch out thy hand forthwith open mine eyes and open them i did not and to be rude to him was a courtesy ah genose ye men at variance with every virtue full of every vice wherefore are ye not scattered from the world for with the vilest spirit of romana I found of you one such, who for his deeds in soul already in cockatus bathes, and still above in body seems alive. So, we are in the very last uh, canto before we get to to the devil, all right? And so, well, this is all cockatus, and so we talked at certain length about the the first of the branches of cactus which was cana uh obviously traitors to their kindred uh, we didn't really mention it by name in my last interpretation but we had the second division antonora traitors to their country so traitors to their kindred traitors to their country and now we have the final river which is or the final division which is uh Ptolemaea, traitors to their friends and so this is where we get to understand uh count ugolino and uh archbishop ruggieri so 
uh, without having to get into too much detail about their own relationships, suffice to say that uh, Count of Galeno uh, had been the head of the Guelph party, which we know is a constant theme going on with Florence and with Dante's particular experience. Uh, but we see that this man who in the last canto, at the end of the last canto, has cracked open a dude's skull and he's gnawing on his brains. The person doing the gnawing is Count Galino, and the person that's lunch is uh, Archbishop uh, Ruggieri. And so they had worked together, uh, but had fallen in, uh, Count Galino had fallen into a trap um, and so he was put with his four sons into a dungeon and starved. And so as each one of the Count's um, sons starved, uh, he ate them. So there's two parts to this sin, which is beautiful because we see the further down we get that there's not one sin that puts a person here. There's there's multiple aspects. We have treason and we have conceit again. Treason and conceit, treason and conceit. We see more and more conceit build the further down into hell we get. So he betrayed his, and obviously cannibalism, we have treason. Uh, he betrayed his fellow Florentines which got him into his situation in the first place because he was plotting to kill uh, uh, the archbishop's nephew, Nino. That backfires. So now he's in a dungeon. So he could have stayed at treason and murder and repented. He did not. So treason and murder. And now because he has to live, what, in a prison where he knows he's going to die anyway, he chooses to resort to cannibalism, which is traitorous not just to friends in this division but traitorous to his very family and traitorous to mankind to consume human flesh remember a man's flesh is, is is their dignity is beyond being consumed so we have treason murder cannibalism but then even as he's down here he's seeking some understanding some forgiveness from uh, Dante. He he wants rationalization. What does every sin want? It wants rationalization. If I just tell you my story as to why I'm eating this dude's brain and why he deserves it, then you'll understand that I'm vindicated. Well, no. That man has his own sins and you have your sins and the one sin does not vindicate the other. So, conceit. So, look right here before we get to the devil. We have four sins in one man, treason, murder, cannibalism, and conceit. That's the first half of the canto. So moving on to the second half of the canto, we get to where Dante talks to Friar Abarigo. And he's surprised because he thought the friar was still alive on earth. And the friar makes reply that in a way he is, that he's been down in hell long before he's dead. What? That sounds weird. And you find out that the reason for that is, is that there are some men that are so evil uh, that demons take their place during life while their soul is sucked down to this second to last worst part of hell uh, early before the, the body even dies. And so the demon basically um, babysits that body until the soul dies. I have thoughts on that. That can be taken literally. Um, however, this is literature. It's not necessarily meant to be taken literally. I think the message here is this. Uh, I don't think if we were to assume most of Dante were to be correct, which I do, uh, full disclosure, personal opinion, uh, that this one would be taken literally as much as it would be taken for its mechanics. Pay attention to where we are in hell. We're in Traderville, and or rather Lake Trader, uh, and so. Uh, they betray their their fellow countrymen, they betray mankind, they betray their friends. They've betrayed humanity here to where nothing of humanity is left in them. Translates to demons. So that's what Dante is trying to say here is that having a demon in them and not having a human soul in them is meant to be symbolic for there not being any humanity left in that shell. 
therefore only a demon can be there. So that person is already in hell, which is consistent with Catholic teaching. The Catechism teaches that there are two states of heaven and there are two states of hell. Uh, you can, if you are in line with God, even if you're not perfect yet, but you're in union, you're not in a state of mortal sin, you are in heaven on earth already. You are in union with the saints and God. Now, when you die, there will also be uh, a physical heaven. However, inversely, uh, if you are not in union with God on earth, you are already in hell. And then you will also suffer the physical hell and the, the life to come. Is that not consistent with this? The characters here have violated, they have forfeited, they have betrayed their humanity so much that nothing of humanity is left in them but hell, ergo, a citizen of hell, a demon, and their souls are down in hell already. They are in a living hell. Uh, 